I think Dick can uh, honestly has every right to call himself a member of the class of 70 because his first semester at Haverford College was the same as the first semester of uh, we of the class of 70, the fall of 1966. Um, if you read his bio on Wikipedia, you know that he had previously been teaching at Yale, but had been denied tenure. And this opened the door for his coming to Haverford. Though not as widely known as the free speech movement at Berkeley, or the teach-ins that started at the University of Michigan, both of which began at about the same time, this Bernstein affair, where he was denied tenure at about the same time, similarly sparked a widespread student faculty protest. Well, Yale's loss was Haverford's gain. And Dick Bernstein went on to build what some have called, in spite of its small size, one of the best undergraduate philosophy departments in the United States at that time. That's the big picture. And the smaller picture is told in the individual histories of many Haverford students whose lives were changed by their interactions with Dick Bernstein and his colleagues at Haverford. During our time at Haverford, philosophy became the most popular major. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Dick. You know, I've been in touch with Ben over the years, and when he uh, proposed this, it seemed to me like a lovely idea. Um, and as uh, it's come closer um, uh, to this occasion, and even a lovely idea for the following reason. Um, although I'm still going and I'm still teaching, I, I don't know, some of you may know I actually started teaching when I was uh, 22 in 1954. You know, I've been teaching almost continuously uh, since then, and still with a great deal of enthusiasm. But I, when I think back of my teaching career, I think the most exciting period was uh, the time during your class, the years that you were at Haverford. I mean, this was, you know, the ferment of the 60s people were, um, were rebellious people were not sort of accepting uh, uh, all kinds of cliches. Students were uh, just alive to all sorts of things. So I remember, you know, being, you know, it was a lovely time meeting students, being challenged by students. And of course, with some of you, I've kept up uh, uh, contact uh, since that time. Um, I'm really, as a, I want to reiterate what Ben said is that I'm really happy to talk about anything. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, this book and uh, so forth. But when he first talked to me, since I thought that this was to be, that you wanted not just to reminisce, but you all might have an intellectual discussion, it seemed to me that this was an easy read. This book is now is probably the most popular thing I've ever written. It's been translated to 10 languages and it's still going. Um, uh, there's been this kind of enormous, in fact, I'm going to tell two stories. One story is how I met on Arendt, because it was at Haverford. Uh, it was uh, just after you people, your class graduated. It was in 1972. Um, and at that time, intellectually, I did not have much interest in Hot Arendt. In fact, I was rather hostile. For various reasons. I didn't like the way she interpreted Marx. I didn't like the way she interpreted Hegel. But Sarah Schumer invited her to give a talk. In fact, the talk that she gave is the talk on the Pentagon Papers on lying politics. And when she came to Africa, she said she wanted to meet me. And the reason she wanted to meet me is that um, I had published this first, my first, this is not my first, but this book, Praxis and Action at the University of Pennsylvania, and the editor was a friend of hers and sent her the book, and she came to tell me how much she wanted to tell me she liked the book. And um, that night, I don't know if any of you remember the Haverford Hotel. That's where we used to put up guests. guests. We may have met at um, uh, 8 o'clock, and we talked and argued at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and it was a kind of beginning... She only lived another three years, but it was 
uh, the basis of a kind of close and very intense friendship. As I uh, said in one of the books I dedicated to her, it was agonistic because we were arguing, but it was also erotic in the sense that there was this great attraction. There are many other aspects of my uh, friendship. And I've been interested in her work since that time. Uh, or I got interested when I started reading it um, uh, closely. I've written now two books on her. One book is on how to rent the Jewish question. And then this little book, and a lot of articles that, that uh, deal with her. I still find myself uh, talking and arguing uh, with her uh, uh, today. Uh, let me tell you a bit about how the book got to be written. Uh, because that's also a funny story or a nice story. Um, I'm, um, I publish a press called Polity Press, which is one of the best presses dealing with uh, social themes, uh, political themes. And I'm a good friend of the editor. And frequently when he comes to New York, he lives in England, uh, we have lunch and uh, this is now three Marches ago. I think it's three years ago, March, or maybe four. Um, uh, asking what I was working on, and he was being really polite. And then we got to talking about the fact that after Trump got elected, I mean, the social media went wild and still does with Hunter Rent. I mean, it's all, it's all over the place. There isn't a week, there isn't a quotation or a citation or kind of reference to it. And it was at that point that he lit up and he said, look, we have a new series, short books written for the intended for general readers. And he said, why don't you write a book about why we should read Hunter Rent now? And that, that is the title of the book, Why Read Hunter Rent Now. Um, so that's how the book got to be written. And in some ways I've, uh, it doesn't surprise me because wherever I go in the world, it can be uh, uh, Korea, it could be Belgrade. There are always pockets of people who are dedicated, have a kind of dedicated, and who find their. Uh, her, I, even when I teach on her, right, I find that uh, uh, frequently she speaks to students, speaks to people. Uh, now, so there are kinds of passionate followers of her. I'm just not that I'm uncritical of her, but I do think she's a, an interesting and exciting uh, reader. Maybe I should leave it there. And if anybody wants to ask me about my memories of Haverford or the book or any kinds of questions about my, what my career has been like since then, um, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, I just say one more thing. It's what I think Ben said is, you know, a lot of people credit me, but you have to remember, I got to have a fit. Uh, Paul was there. Paul Desjardins is the reason, is the one who really seduced me to come to have a fit. Pink was already there, although I knew him from uh, Yale. And R.A. was there uh, at that time. So, uh, and I think we did something remarkable because I think um, we cultivated good teaching. And it was great fun. I mean, uh, I think each each person in the philosophy department had a distinctive personality. And it is true. It is quite remarkable. I remember when Change Magazine wrote an article about Haverford, they called it classic to the core. And they did say that we were the, you know, kind of most outstanding undergraduate philosophy department. And we did achieve something which I don't think anybody has ever achieved any place else. Because during the period was, we were there philosophy was the most popular major. I don't know if any of you were involved or remember students standing all night to get into philosophy 101. Um, uh, but uh, I do remember that. And I do remember the excitement of teaching at that time. And I've gone on, I mean, my years, I mean, I didn't leave Haverford out of discontent. I enjoyed half of it. I was being asked when I went to the school in 89, I was being asked to really sort of recreate a kind of philosophy department, a pluralistic department, like the one that we had at half of it. And we've done that at the school. So I've been happy. And I always wanted to come back to New York at some point. That's where we live now. So I, 
I consider myself, I use the word here for I'm lucky. I've been lucky in my life because I've been able to do what I want, teach what I want. Um, academic life, I think, is getting worse and worse and more constrictive. Um, but I never really suffered from that. Um, and I've been able, we were able to do, I've been able to do at the new school what we did at Haverford. At Haverford, we were all friends. There was a sense in which we were just a kind of group of friends, interested in philosophy, working together. And uh, while many academic problems are written, you know, racked with all kinds of dissension and disagreements, uh, ever since I've been from Haverford to now, I've been at very different kinds of creative departments. And I have the same kind of relationship with uh, my colleagues here. Um, of course, now we have women, not just men, but it's been a rather exciting uh, uh, journey. And I, I mean, in some ways, you know, it's a little bit disreputable that I'm teaching, I'm still going and teaching, but I have the enviable position at Hamilton that nobody wants me to retire. I will retire next year. I figured by the time I'm 90, then it's time to really uh, retire. But I just, I just finished teaching an undergraduate. I mean, I teach graduate students to a great extent, but I teach undergraduates too. And um, many of whom are now younger than my grandchildren. I always said to myself, the day I'm not communicating with students, I'm gonna quit. But um, I still manage somehow, we still manage to talk to them, to each other, and they still manage. And, you know, despite all the kinds of things you hear uh, uh, about career orientation and STEM and so forth, of course, the school is not like that. There are still lots of students that are turned on and get excited by philosophy. And so um, for me, uh, teaching is, I mean, I, my, my two great joys academically are teaching and writing. I'm still writing. I've written. You know, I don't know how many books I've written, but I get up every morning and I think and I write. Uh, I'm only teaching now uh, in spring semester. So next June, next spring semester will be my last official uh, semester teaching and teaching. But, you know, retirement for me is doing more of the same. And I'm sure I'll continue teaching and writing after that. OK, so let me leave it there and see what you want to talk about. And it could be, as I say, about uh, about Haverford, about what it was like when you were there, or about the honor rent and the issues that she raises, that I raise in this little book, okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I took it upon myself to, to ask, uh, set it up so that I ask the first question, and it, it does relate to the book. Right. Um, so here, here's, what, here's the question. Um, we hear a lot about resentment as a root cause for some of our political troubles today. Um, in your words, we often find that this is this in, quote, people who feel that they have been neglected or forgotten, end quote. Here are two other formulations I've come across recently. Quote, resentment comes down to an assessment that city people don't care about all the things that we hold dear, end quote. Or alternatively, quote, resentment is a cultural response to economic struggle. End quote. So how we try to address this problem seems to me to depend on understanding its true roots. So can you say anything more about this, Dick? Where does this resentment really come from? Yeah, look, I, I don't want to resent a, uh, I, I'm not capable of a deep analysis of what's really going on and what has gone on. I certainly want to recognize the phenomenon. And I think that what you're talking about um, you know, uh, I want to make this related to my, the theme when why I wrote the book the way or which I did. I think that uh, our art had an enormous insight into the a lot of the darkness of our times. I mean, it's not, she would never say we're living in a totalitarian society, but if she understood what she called the subterranean forces, when she wrote this book on the origins of totalitarian, I think I, quote, I do quote the sentence where she says, you know, totalitarian regimes, which were for her Nazi Germany, 
and uh, Stalinist Russia may end, but the totalitarian solutions may well survive. And I think one of the sources of popularity is the way which began to see that these tendencies not only exist in the United States, but throughout the world. I mean, this is in that sense, a dark time. Uh, I'm gonna get back to resentment in, in a minute. Um, but the other is the message of hope and illumination. I mean, one of her deepest themes that she suggests is that, you know, no matter how dark things seem, seem to be and how awful and, uh, she does not just referring to what happened in, in Germany, but you know, I mean, in fact, some of the descriptions, the darkness of times is when, when lying is accepted, when people don't accept the truth anymore. That's the way she describes it uh, in different ways. Um, that there's always that ability for people to come together, to be empowered, to change things, uh, et cetera. Um, and that double message, uh, not being Pollyannish is what I find characteristic of her, her, her thinking. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any kind of simple analysis or simple key to understanding why there is so much resentment. We know the obvious. We know the loss of status. We know the loss of people who had decent lives who were suddenly be as a result of that. We know that in effect that this country miserably failed in paying attention to lots of people who were suffering, losing their status, uh, et cetera. Um, I do not accept the idea that this is now so entrenched and so deep and so uh, uh, magnified because of social me media that you know, people are in their own bubbles. I do believe that um, if I don't want to say this time will pass, I do believe in the possibility of another amelioration. And I think it's important to try to reach out, to try to understand, to try to do, do something, and to try to escape living in our own bubbles. So that's what I would say in general, without giving a kind of clear analysis that there's one cause or the cause for why there is so much bitterness or resentment right. I, in many places, yeah. Okay, um, I think Thelman has a question. Okay, he always does. Yeah. <laughs> Good for us. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Thelman. Uh, thank you. Um, I also am hesitant to try to do social analysis um, but uh, it's unavoidable to, to some extent. Uh, I was wondering about uh, something you say in the book about um, uh, Arendt and uh, plausibility. Uh, I believe you say that according to, to Arendt, uh, some leaders, I perhaps call them demagogues, uh, whatever the proper term would be, are able to produce images of uh, truth that are plausible. Uh, to, to people. And by virtue of that plausibility, uh, they can uh, have a persuasive effect. But when a politician says that the election is being manipulated by Italian satellites mm -hmm. or by uh, Jewish um, uh, spaceships, um, or uh, I've, I've forgotten, there's so many of them. Um, should one, what should we say about that? What should one say plausibility is no longer um, a standard or should one say you, that? You know, Feldman, this is what I would say. I mean, I don't, I don't want to downplay this. Uh, fanaticism, craziness, conspiracy theory is nothing new. I mean, unfortunately, I think because of social media, it gets spread uh, in a different way. I mean, look, you know, let's even go back to something that I lived through, the McCarthy era, era where there was a communist behind every, you know, every, every person determining them. Um, I don't say it will, pack, you know, it, what I think, craziness is not going to go away. 
but it can be marginal. And that's what I think we have to work at. You know, marginalization so that people increasingly see, you know, that this is crazy. And that and that's one of the things that you did say. Well, I think Arendt had had so much insight. Is this I think that during, say, for example, during the Trump period, I think many liberal people were perplexed that you had factual checking, you know. He didn't have the largest crowd in, in the world. Well, I think a rent really on this is something about propaganda. Propaganda is not always interested in truth. People want to hear a story. It's a story that somehow speaks to them, and it may have nothing to do with reality or, or with facts. And that is the power of it. But I think that the, the only way to uh, is, is, is not to give up. Not to be cynical, not to drop out, not to, in a certain way, and I say, not to be Pollyannish in the sense that everything's going to get together and people are going to have to talk together like a grand seminar, but that craziness that you're talking about will be increasingly marginalized. That's what. That's my hope, and my belief is that um, uh, it, it can happen. I mean, what I I think. I mean, let us think about the other thing. If anybody thinks, I mean, what would have happened if Trump had won the second time? You know, if anybody thinks that it is not the case that fascism and authoritarianism can come to this country, I think that's naive. It can come. And that's why you got to keep working uh, to fight in different ways. So uh, the short answer Hmm. is you're not going to convince somebody who's convinced of some kind of crazy con conspiracy. But would you hope in time that that phenomenon as a social political phenomenon gets marginalized to the crazy and that people, even people who sharply disagree with you, um, that we could begin to find some kind of common ground. That's my hope. Yeah. Okay, if... If anyone wants to ask a question, um, I'm not sure how the raising hand function works, but I know about chatting. Send me a message through chat and I'll call on you. Mm -hmm. You have three hands up, Ben. Okay. I do. Yeah, but George Newman is one of them. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go for it, George. Uh, you, you unmute yourself. Oh, I see the hands. Yes. Okay. George, you need to unmute yourself. Got it. Okay. Hi. So, um, first of Good all, to see you, George. Reading, yeah, yeah, I know. It was it, it was yeah. nice to hear that you were doing this. Uh, I enjoyed reading the book. Early in the book, uh, I, I I wondered. There's there's an issue that's been bothering me, and um, it was raised. I thought indirectly early in the book, and. The, if I remember right, you said that uh, that Hannah Arendt was saying that actions emerge from our unique situations that we we come from it from our from who we are. Yeah. The the where that uh, pushed me was toward an issue that has bothered me for a little while, and that is uh, the topic is Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And um, for a little while, just for a very few couple of weeks after that. Um, phrase became popular uh, after the uh, George Floyd, I guess. Um, a couple of people, uh, some prominent people were saying all lives matter. And I yeah. thought that all lives matter, I thought that it was a great opportunity to, um, to really bring people together in a, to, to make it the case that all lives matter, that it, mm -hmm. that it wasn't, that all wrongs all, all social wrongs, all discriminations, all acts of bias, um, they all should be eliminated without regard to what um, population you come from. Mm -hmm. And because then shortly after Black Lives Matter was, well, the Latinos were saying, well, wait a minute, what about me? And the Asians were saying, well, hello, what about me? And of course, now yeah. we're in a situation where we're dealing with uh, Asian discrimination. So I wondered what you think that Hannah Arendt would say about what I just raised. Yeah, I would first of all think that, you know, if we're dealing, dealing with uh, on a theoretical level, uh, clearly it's the case that all lives should matter. 
you know, that I think is, uh, is the case. But what I think is, um, I mean, maybe uh, I read it differently. Um, I mean, it is the case. When I, I quoted in the book, um, when Hannah Arendt left, uh, you know, she would, was not been strongly identified with the Jewish back, background until the rise of anti-Semitism in, in Germany. And she made a statement, which I think when you are attacked as a Jew, you know, you don't fight back as a world citizen, as just a human being. You have to fight back with your kind of identity. And it seemed to me that the slogan, at least for uh, the black community, was serving as a kind of an assertion of their identity and you cannot ignore us, we're not invisible, so, um, it's, et cetera. So I think when I think when people were using all lives matter, they were not speaking sort of theoretically or making a philosophical point or a human point. It was intended to, to somehow negate and defeat the movement. And that I think is the, the dark side of uh, that uh, um, uh, of that slogan. You would say it, but you could mean it in a way where you what you really mean is that all white lives, you know. Uh, rise. So I think I want to make a distinction between the polemics of action and slogans that really can get people animated to do something in, and dealing with these issues. Well, let's sit back and think. Is, there, is, is dignity universal? Is it really the, the case that it's the case? But it seems to me that even the most prejudiced people in the world will say that all lives matter but they don't take it seriously. So that's would be my, it's the level of discourse. So may not have been the, it, it's a slogan that motivated people. And that's where I really want to put the emphasis. It motivated people, or like with the Asians, it motivated people, that's the Arendtian point. That if you just speak as an individual, you're not going to get, but if you can act together, act in concert, with other sorts of people, there's a possibility for freedom and for a kind of change. So that would be my reflections of the slogan, okay? But as a philosopher, I would certainly want to defend the claim that all our lives really matter. You know? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go to the next hand I see up. I think Stephen Eisdorfer, do you wanna? Thank you. So um, I was not a philosophy student. Uh, I took Phil 12 with you in 1968 and thought I would take philosophy. And then I uh, went to Tink Thompson and said, what's the next course I should take? He said, you should take a Hegel course. I opened the book. I took it back to the bookstore and that was the last of philosophy for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're opening the wrong book. <laughs> well, very, very possible. But in fact, the course had a lot of impact on me. So uh, the question I would like to ask you is something about the, the trajectory of your thought. At a certain point, you began writing about pragmatism. Yes. And you wrote a number of books about pragmatism. Right. Um, and um, I'm interested in whether you think pragmatism is still a useful way of thinking. Uh, and if not, what, well, if so, why? And if not, why not? I certainly do think. But first of all, what you should realize, I don't know if you mean, you know, I have written about a lot of things and a lot of people that have written, you know, you know, on continental philosophers and German philosophers, uh, um, et cetera, so that my uh, interests are quite broad. But I actually wrote my dissertation on John Dewey. And I can tell you what's, what spoke to me then. And indeed, I uh, have written recently about him. And he still speaks to me. Um, uh, Dewey and the form of practice and the concern, the social concerns uh, spoke to me deeply as the best of our American tradition. The best in the sense of, you know, in some ways without na na being naive, believing in the ideals that go back to Jefferson, that we could see them, you know, oh, um, not only in Jefferson, but in Emerson and in Whitman. And there's a story of America, which is the very positive story. I mean, and, you know, there's also the story of America of violence and hate and discrimination, which has been there, we know, since 1619. I mean, 
But the conviction that if you try to apply your intelligence, that you can at least make things better, that it is not the case that you have to accept the status quo, or so that you can change without being utopian, without being sentimental, or, uh, you know, it's what Dewey once called creative intelligence. I believed it then, and I believe that even more today. I really do. You know. So in that sense, if you take, you know, the difficulty with the word pragmatic is if you take it in the vulgar sense, you know, hey, pragmatic is, you know, just figuring out how to do things and not being believing in principles. That's not what the classical American pragmatists, whether it be Peirce or James or Dewey, really believed. They, they had ideals uh, about this, but they believed that, the, that action is important that you, you know, they were against the conception of philosophy as merely contemplative, merely a spectator, and it, it, the emphasis is always on agency. And that, um, I mean, I like to think it's refined and deepened in me, but I haven't given up on it. And in that sense, I think that the true pragmatic spirit is as relevant today. In fact, it's more important right now because it strikes me that the options today are to live in your own bubble or to give up. I'm always worried about the prevalence of opting out and being cynical. And that is a great temptation for many, many people. And it's something that I think I've dedicated my life to fighting against. You know, so. And, you know, it's reflected. You know, one of the things that I have to also tell you about my habit for days um, uh, in a uh, thing is uh, recently my granddaughter discovered I had a very significant FBI file, which I have the transcript of, and I'm very proud of, in which they quote statements when I was encouraging students to burn their draft cards, you know? Oh, I discovered my phones were tapped, you know? Uh, and so, um, you know, and when I hear and they actually have verbatim quotes from speeches that I gave at Haverford. Um, I, I consider that part of my dossier. <laughs> so, and I've been involved in social action groups. I was in, involved, I don't know if you realize that uh, prior to coming to Haverford, 64, I was at, um, in, when I was still at Yale, I went to Mississippi during the, free, the Freedom Summer of 64. And it was memorable, it's still memorable for me. He, at that time. And then later, I was involved with, um, with dissidents from Eastern Europe and Yugoslavia. So, uh, and I've always felt that that's a manifestation of the best of the pragmatic spirit. That I would say pragmatism, true pragmatism is, and if you come back, you know, I'm going to give a course of pragmatism next year. I'll give you, 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 can, you can take it free for free. <laughs> Okay. I'm, I would yeah. like to do that. I actually came to it via Richard Rorty. Oh, I started, well. I started Richard, reading Richard Rorty's books, and I said, why does this sound familiar to me? <laughs> well, you know, you know that Dick Rorty was, a, my, was probably my closest intellectual friend. We were friends in the time that we were undergraduates at the University of Chicago. Thing. So, and I've written a lot about Rorty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's a good way to come to progress. Yeah. Chuck Shields, you want to? Yep. Thanks. Uh, thanks there, Ben. Now, Dick, I've been appreciating what you're saying. I really appreciate the, the optimistic uh, point of view that you're taking on things. I find that uh, really, really wonderful. I did want to make one comment on the Black Lives Matter discussion yeah. that we had briefly before. Yeah. And I, I take the, the phrase as being affirmative and not exclusionary. Um, but the uh, the question I wanted to uh, to ask goes back to what you were saying about um, uh, marginalizing, yeah. uh, marginalizing craziness. Yeah. Uh, you stop short of saying ways that you thought that might happen. Do you have some suggestions? Um. You know, I'm a little bit always leery. First, I want to go to the beginning about optimism. I'm not optimistic in the sense, you know, to say, I, I once wrote a, an article on democratic hope. And I think hope is not where things up being optimistic about the future. 
uh, but having a deep conviction and even realizing that things might get worse, nevertheless, not giving up. That's for me what, what, what I want to consider. So if I wouldn't want my remarks to say, well, you know, it's all going to get better. I don't know. But not to give up, to keep fighting in different sorts of ways. In some ways, it was very much an effort that happened for it. You know, at that, at that time, I mean, you know, I'm going to I'm going to take a um, a detour and then come back to to what you said. The detour is um, there were several reasons I went to have it, but one of the reasons that I went to that I was attracted to have it, as I say, I went to to graduate school during the McCarthy period. I remember when I first went to Yale, I couldn't believe it because most of the students were more sympathetic with people like uh, Buckley and and and, thing. and then I began seeing things change in terms of the student movement. And I always took, I always respected the fact that Haverford took a strong stand. It's one of the few places in college and university that did not cooperate with the government at that particular time. And um, I don't know if you know some of the story about Ross Stetler, who was really quite a radical student, and the state threatened to take away his fellowships. They haven't been said if the state takes it away, we will, we will do it ourselves. I mean, it, it, the way it stood up, that was, for me, deeply attractive about that, that positive, not just the anti-war, but the positive sense of dignity. And, and I took that seriously. And that really appealed to me, although I was not a Quaker uh, uh, at that time. But coming back to, to what you said, I think you put it very nicely. I think that it was that the Black Lives Matter was intended to be affirmative. And where I see it having its really most significant effect is locally. I begin to thinking that the most interesting politics now is in is local politics, not at the government level and so forth, but the ability to begin to do more progressive things in different cities and different parts of the country. And there it does seem to me, it's beginning to have some effect, you know, or modulating things about the police. I mean, it's, they're not gonna end the police. They're not gonna do these sorts of things. Racism is not going to go away. But it does seem to me that there's a growing sense that this is an issue and that more and more people are being, being concerned. And what I'm hoping is that the coming together, I'm recognizing, I mean, you know, even let's go back to the people that were caricature, rednecks and so forth, there's more common ground than people will sometimes sort of acknowledge. I'm hoping that a kind of sanity the, in which people can begin to at least not argue with each other if they're not shouting at each other, will we emerge? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I, that is my hope. And I think it's so if we just, we work on, on this and we try to be open and listen to what are the real complaints and dissatisfactions of the uh, the people who are on the other side, yeah. So I have faith that that can happen, yeah. yeah. And I think it, I don't think I learned it, but it was reinforced that happened. <laughs> um, Kurt Preston, can you uh, join in? You know, I think he's in a vehicle, so maybe okay. not bendable. Eric, do you want to take your turn? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, Kurt. Uh, hi, Professor Bernstein. Uh, I was uh, I was thinking about the fact that uh, the uh, philosophy department was the most popular department for students. Uh, because you were like the uh, 1927 Yankees, murderers row with uh, arrogance and the truth. We had Bernstein, Cosmic, Major Day, uh, and Thomas and the Magazine. So uh, that, that's why I became a philosophy major. And I, uh, I, I studied in Germany and here in direct privilege. My question is, regarding Anna Arendt, is her position about Zionism, she said that she was a real outlier uh, in, in the Jewish organization, that she had 
a much different approach than the other Zionist uh, organizations, including the, uh, the, uh, You're, you're breaking up a little bit, Kurt, but I think uh, the gist of your question is clear, isn't it, Dick? I mean, he, he was asking about Arendt's position on Israel. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, that, that, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm just thinking how, how much I want to, where I want to begin. Mm -hmm. um, Arendt, when she first left Germany in 1933, um, I tell the story in the book that she helped the Zionists and she was interrogated, interrogated for eight days, but was lucky that she could, that she was uh, released. And that's when she decided to leave in the spring of 1933. And when she left, I mean, then she made up her mind that she really wanted to work on uh, Jewish issues and she was worked very closely with Zionists. She never joined the Zionist party because she felt that they were the people that were doing it. Now, when she broke with the Zionists, when you reread it, it's really interesting. She broke with the Zionists um, when it was becoming increasingly clear that, um, that the, at least the, the World Zionist Organization, American Zionist, was becoming more and more insensitive to the Arab issue. And indeed, in some of the uh, famous meetings that took place in the 40s, they weren't even mentioning the Arabs. I mean, after all, the majority of the population of Palestine were Arabs. And this, she, her vision, um, and it was a vision represented by a small group, mainly of intellectual living, where she wanted a Jewish homer. She wanted a binational state. That is a state, and if we're going to have it, not uh, a state in which there would be, and to use her own term, Jewish and Arab councils working together. Uh, and so she made a sharp distinction between a Jewish state, which she was against, and a solution in which there was some way in which there was an attempt. If I, and this, I, well, I don't want to go into all the politics because you remember that this is the time of the end of the trusteeship. This is the time when uh, the UN proposed a partition in from it. Um, she was on the, on the losing side of this issue. What I think is so interesting, and she wrote this in 1948, There'll never be peace in the, I'm quoting her. There'll never be peace in the Middle East unless Jews and Arabs negotiate with each other. Um, and in a way, she was considered, you know, disloyal, uh, betraying the thing. But what I find interesting that uh, maybe as a result of uh, even the last little war is that increasingly there are at least a group of Israelis who are much more sympathetic to her vision. She's not, she was not for it. And they were not sympathetic to a two-state solution, but to a kind of a solution in which you have one state, but there is greater recognition of the autonomy of uh, the Arab population, particularly the Palestinian population. I must say, I'm very sympathetic with that. It may be, seem utopian now, but I think that what's going on you know, um, in terms of the last regime is disastrous in terms of this. And this is one of the lessons that you would think that some Israelis learn 
from this. It's not just Hamas as an organization. You know, all the cities, in even the sort of cities where there are Arabs and Jews living together, there was this kind of opposition. This is just going to continue to go on and on unless we get to some type of solution which recognizes a greater uh, equality for the opposite. So I think that she was, she was never afraid to be on the losing side. She was viciously attacked for her position. But the, I find it interesting that many, at least uh, people on the left in Israel, are very sympathetic to the idea that she had of what might be uh, the, a binational state in the Middle East. Okay. Um, Eric? Thanks, Ben. And, and thank you very much for organizing this program. I know what it takes and really appreciate your having done so. Uh, Dick, I never had you in class, but I do remember some Saturday taking a job off the job board and planting um, some ground cover at your house. Oh! Feeling that I was sort of... Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> in a... In, in some altered state, being uh -huh. close to, to you and your house. I'm here on the coast of Maine with Mike Snyder, so two times the class Good. of 70. And my question is a little bit different than what we've been talking about so far. I have appreciated what I would call your kind of guarded and realistic optimism, the, the, yeah. the commitment to keeping the faith with principles and ideals. It, in, in the face of Trumpism, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that concerns me and keeps me up at night has to do with the tendency on the left, and I largely identify myself as on the left, but we see it at Haverford and other campuses of a kind of intolerance of open discussion, uh, hypersensitivity to microaggressions and triggers. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, are we emerging in a world where the left is the inhibitor of free speech rather than the right? Mm -hmm. And if so, how do we, how do we go get back to a place where, where those of us who identify with the left can feel on solid ground challenging those on the right who, who would um, destroy free speech? Yeah. You know, I'm extremely sympathetic with what you're saying. Um, and I think we have to be careful. Uh, there is true this, this intolerant element of extremism. Extremism can take a right form and a left form. And sometimes it doesn't make much difference, you know. And shutting off, I mean, discourse, which is has gone on on various college campuses. I mean, it's something, of course, that you know the far right is always exploiting, but it does seem to me that, um, you know, uh, I don't want to make a difference between the true left and extremism, but that's something to be fought with equal vigor. It really is, you know, that we have to stand up and not tolerate it. it, it, it if you're going to shut down people from talking, eh, that is, and thinking you're doing this because they have terrible views and so forth. I mean, this is a betrayal of the best sorts of principles. So I think that one has to stand up against that as well as on it, not be, you know, how can I put it, not be wishy-washy about it, you know? Shutting down talk, whether it comes from the right or the left, is intolerable. I mean, I've always believed my life, my whole I mean, I like to think this is things I did at Haverford. My whole life has been dedicated to trying fostering communities of dialogue. And dialogues mean not only talking, listening, learning how to listen into things. And when you draw the line and you say, I'm not going to listen, I don't care where it comes from, for me, that's a no. -no. So stand up for your principles. <laughs> and don't be taken in by, um, uh, I mean, for example, I teach now at the new school and I teach the undergraduate and it's known as a progressive and liberal in, in institution. What I find more impressive here is that element is almost insignificant. 
uh, here. So don't be taken in by the kind of idea that this is what's taking over the left and extremists. There are, and there are people like that. And as soon as there are people like that, you can be sure on social media, it's going to be blown up by the far right. But don't exaggerate. I don't think it's as prevalent as many people think it is as a media. Some of the media make us think it is. Yeah. Thanks, Dick. Yeah. Warren, Warren, you want to? I should put a plug for my daughter's book. <laughs> you know, I think anybody who, um, uh, some of you may have here on NPR, my daughter is Andrea Bernstein, who's, a, in my opinion, a great journalist, written a wonderful book on the history of the Krishna and the Trump family about oligarchy in America. It's a really a terrific book. <laughs> yeah. It's a New York Times bestseller. None of my books have been New York Times bestsellers. <laughs> <laughs> Warren? <Yeah>. Sure. <clears throat> Well, first, <clears throat> let me say that uh, my daughter is here too, and I'm very proud of her as well. <laughs> so, ah, um, good. but that's great to hear. Um, I do want to say it. This is I find this really extraordinary that after 50 years, that our class is, is able to reconnect with one of our, our one of our most distinguished professors. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Dr. Bernstein. I think that's uh, this is really quite quite something. Um, I was a biology major and I- Oh, you were in that great biology department. Yeah, another good department in Haverford, but regrettably, so didn't take any uh, philosophy courses. Um, but I have to say, this is a very strange day uh, as far as philosophy goes. First, with the very sad news of uh, uh, Ariel Cosman's uh, right. passing. Um, is, is, yeah. And also just before the Zoom, um, something flashed up on our local news. I, I still live very close to Haverford College. Uh, and literally something came up in the news warning people that, that um, poison hemlock is growing in our area. Um, so um, I just thought that was kind of a, a strange thing to announce uh, right before a philosophy uh, session. Is it really true? Yes, it's actually true. Yeah. So um, I do have a question though that relates to the book. Um, and Arendt discusses the, this concept of self-deception self right. playing a primary role in totalitarian leaders. Yes. And the concept of self-deception, you know, I think is a very interesting complex one. Again, I'm not a philosopher, so, right. but I gather it has various philosophical and psychological and cognitive scientific views on it, yeah. you know, it's a. It's sort of by nature almost paradoxical. Oh, mm -hmm. is it? Does it really exist? Does it require a quote unconscious mind the way Freud thought, or is yeah. it something really adaptive like this concept of uh, of uh, self deception in the service of deceiving others? Yeah. Um, one, you know, Trump may be perhaps a great example of of self deception facilitating the deceiving of others. And so I thought, could you comment on any further on uh, Hannah Arendt's view, as well as your own philosophic view about the nature of self-deception? Yeah, uh, um, I think it's a tremendously important concept. You see, sometimes let's go back to Trump. Um, uh, I've asked myself, I mean, for example, um, does he know that the election was really valid and he's just using this as a political ploy? Or does he really believe it? Right. And I think at times I come close to thinking he really believes it. You know, he really doesn't believe it. And that's where you see the danger of self-deception. I mean, uh, Hunter Arendt makes this very interesting distinction. Uh, one form of lying, this goes all the way back to Plato, is the form of lying where you know you're telling a lie. You know what the truth is, and that you are now trying to give, you're trying, the example of Plato is that you know that an animal is a mule, and you're trying to convince somebody that it's a horse, but you know it. Now, that I think is a standard form of lying. But I think what can happen 
is where one actually comes, doesn't even have the resources to know that you're lying. And I really do think that in many instances that it was characteristic of Trump, okay? And that, um, I mean, I'm not going to go into the, I, I don't know enough to go into the kind of psychology, but I really do believe that he believes, he thinks that many of the things that he say, which others want to say is untrue, are true. And in a, that essay on truth and politics, she makes this, what I think is the, is a, not shocking, but disturbing remark, that the real danger is that people can't tell the difference mm -hmm. between a lie. I mean, in, um, about it's much easier to deal with lies when you know the truth and you don't try to fool or something or what goes on in advertising. But when you are doing, and I think that she also illustrates, I mean, one of the things that I think it's getting a lot of notice recently um, because of the anniversary, that you, if you go back to the Pentagon papers, what's so shocking about the story that was to, being told is at that time, the intelligent community knew the truth. We're not winning a war, you know, and that all the stuff about body counts is not true. And yet the decision makers somehow don't have that on their screen. So it isn't as if they knew that we really, I mean, some of the people in uh, Mac Barrow's group, but they really believed some of the things that they were saying. So that's a sense in which uh, without my being able to give a complete thing, the phenomenon, I think, is a real phenomenon, on, and it is a very dangerous one, because then somehow the distinction between truth and falsity, he, I mean, it's not just a matter of fake news. It's a matter where you yourself don't even see that there's a distinction between lying and truth. That's a real, that's really dangerous. Right, so I think the self-deception is um, is is powerful and has can have and has had disaster, disastrous consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ben, and I don't know if people are running out of questions, but I have a question. Okay, my question is: Do I sound very different than I did in nineteen? Is sixty in in your class? No, nope. no, <laughs> it's all the same <laughs> in many ways. Uh, Tom, you want to jump in? I like to think that that is. I like to think this is oh, absolutely. Kind of, what? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'll. I'd like to add to the answer to your uh, question, Dick, which is. Um, I, I read the book and I've also watched uh, some video of you. So I, I was prepared to understand that you are talking just like you were then. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you. I like and, and to you, think so. <laughs> and, and you've really just kept an audience of people engaged on highfalutin topics now for, you know, over an hour, uh, which is uh, just amazing. And um, and I, I, I want to thank you. I also want to thank Warren. If he doesn't plug his daughter's book like you plug your daughter's, I will plug his daughter's book, Amanda Gefter, Trans Trespassing on Einstein's Lawn. Um, uh -huh. Semi-transformative for me and my understanding of uh, quantum mechanics. And my question is going to be unusual. And you, you might have expected that. But Warren kind of set me up by talking about self-delusion. And this is a philosophy day. And, you know, isn't the original self-delusion that we are separate selves? Uh, the fact of the matter is we are all deeply interconnected and you can see that materialistically, existentially, or in various uh, spiritual ways. And I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And of course, and so did Hannah Arendt. And, and I think, you know, we know that the, we need to act collectively. It's not all about us individually, but what my biggest takeaway that I hadn't really gotten until I got refreshed here was her saying, we need to stop and think, right? And yes. you say we need to stop and talk with each other, but, you know, haven't we been trying, trying that long enough to realize that it, you know, looking at our own mental formulations, as the Buddhists would yeah. say, and you said suffering enough that I guess it's okay for me to talk about Buddhism. I mean, the Buddhists say we've got to look at our own mental formulations, the knee-jerk reactions that we have. Um, and you can't just by a matter of willpower say, oh, I'm going to process the content of my experience and make sure I see it's all impermanent. You have to yeah. do exercise. You have to do things that make you change so that gradually you become that way. So my question yeah. for you is, why don't Buddhists and political philosophers talk more? 
Uh, I, uh, you know, I uh, uh, I want to challenge the last claim. Good. I mean, it is the case. Philosophy is practiced in uh, uh, throughout the world or in Western countries. It tends to be Eurocentric, or it tends to be American centric, and that um, uh, most of us are really ignorant. Not just of uh, uh, of uh, of Buddhism, but of Confucianism. By the way, a great counterforce to that was Paul Desjardins. Paul well. was a person who I remember, even among the philosophers, was teaching us Chinese character. I do think there is a large community of people. Um, whether it be, I don't want to just make it just Buddhism, but uh, I have to think about Confucianism in a minute. Who are interested? in that discourse between, uh, I don't like the term East and Western philosophy because I'm not convinced that there are major differences, but I think that there is more, at least among intellectuals, um, more discussion of these topics than you might think. I myself have had, I've now been to China three times and, um, I've been at conferences on John Dewey and Confucianism. There's a whole movement of real interpretation. I mean, that I think I know more about Confucianism than a book about Buddhism, but a whole movement of people who are reinterpreting Confucius and see certain types of deep affinities with things in American philosophy. And I've been participating in those particular discussions. I mean, I don't no Chinese characters, but I've read a lot now about it. So I think um, whether it goes on with popular people, I think there is a, there are groups, certainly among intellectuals, where this kind of discourse really does go on in a very profitable sort of way. And I'm sure it's the same thing that takes place with Confucianism or, and say uh, American, American philosophy is taking place with people who are uh, Bruce, and there are my very frequently. I st have students. Yeah, I had I'll give you a good example. I just taught an undergraduate course on practice, and I had an undergraduate who was deeply interested in Buddhism. She wrote her paper on Buddhism and American practice. So it's it's there, but not in large numbers. Yeah, I mean, I think we're past the days. I mean, we're past the days of just. Uh, you know, that stuff is for outliers and so on. I think that, that no, I think there's a more receptivity in different circles. Yeah. Have you been involved in Buddhism? Have you been involved no. in Buddhism? Yeah. Uh, yes, very much. Yeah. I lead meditation uh, almost every day. Okay. And I think meditation as a practice helps you uh, do the kind of stopping and thinking that Hannah Arendt was talking about. By the way, I see, I, then I, I mean, I take meditation very seriously. And I think that you are, uh, you, you're signaling something that was just tremendously important for her. And I think in, because so, so many people are not, not, not I mean, if we're using thinking in this technical sense, not thinking just as thinking out of solving a problem or doing a thing, but just think what you're doing. Um, I think many, many people don't do this. I think it's important as a philosophy teacher, I'm always trying to encourage. You know, think about your life. Think about what you what's going on, on, on here. Is this what you really want to do? Yeah. So I take that. I mean, I think that the American idiom catches beautifully what she had in mind by the notion of thinking, which is a kind of thinking that is not simply utilitarian, but uh, but it deals with the issues of meaning. Yeah, right. and I sh I share that. Well, that department made anyone who took any course in it stop and think all the time. Uh, and for everyone, <laughs> so thank well, you. Well, the other thing, and I I. And grateful, you know, that uh, I talked about Dick Rorty, but Paul Desjardins was a friend of mine from back at Yale. And I, to this day, am grateful to Paul because of the way in which he introduced me to Confucianism, to Buddhism, to meditation. 
And I take very seriously something that you said, practice, you know? I even think of that in terms of my own life and my own writing, you know, that by coming and trying to write something, sometimes brilliant ideas come, sometimes they don't. But if you do not practice, then it's not going to happen. So I take the idea of practice in ourselves and practice in the social world very seriously. Okay. It's nice to see so many people who still are influenced by their pack by their days that have been. Yeah, you know. George, then, did you have a yes, a very quick comment based on what Tom and Dick were just talking about. Uh, yeah. So I'm a I'm a neurologist. I had yeah. uh, have headed stroke programs in three major universities since 1995. Um, We've uh, had a practice of a multidisciplinary rounds when all the nurses, therapists, doctors, uh -huh. and everybody else gets together and talks about all the patients that we're taking care of over the course of the day and their families. And every day since 1995, we end that meeting with a quote from Buddha. Uh -huh. And all of us reflect on that before we go do our work. You want to share the quote with us? Oh, sure. Um, some of them are... Or several quotes, yeah. Oh, no. There we uh, many different quotes over the oh, course I see, of I the see. years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, you... the, first, the first one that comes to mind is simply the saying that life is so difficult. How can we be anything but kind? Yeah. You see, you're making my point. You're, you're making the point that I think the idea of... Now you, uh, you're, and you're a good example because you're a hard core of scientists mm -hmm. who do not find these things foreign. You find them helpful. And I think that phenomenon is, you know, not a mass phenomenon, but more mm -hmm. widespread than people appreciate, or knowledge at least. Yeah, so there you, you exemplify my point that it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're not just having intellectual uh, discussions about Buddhism, but that somehow it is relevant to your work as a... As a mm -hmm. And this is something that I learned in Philosophy 101. Well, thank God for Philosophy 101. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was Philosophy 11, actually. I must, I must say, though, that um, one of the most gratifying things over the years, not just from your class, you know, as a teacher, you never know what you're communicating. You never know what effect you're having. One of the most gratifying is I get emails to this day from Haverford students saying, well, taking that course changed my life. Well, that's it did. It did. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and you also illustrate something that I think we believe that Haverford, I believe to this day. Um, I'm not interested in turning out professional philosophers, but I do believe that the study of philosophy, no matter what you do, can you help shape your life? And you're a good example. <laughs> and that statement has not changed since 1966. You oh, I said, said that then? You said it now. Well, I believe it. I really do believe <laughs> it now. And I think we conducted the department that way. We're interested in sending the people to grad. Some people went to graduate school, but that was not the purpose. And that, um, and you, by the way, there is empirical evidence to this. It's empirical evidence that many students who studied philosophy as undergraduates do exceedingly well in their professions. You know, it's a, a statistical difference. Right. And it would make sense because if you get the right kind of philosophy, it is it's about thinking. And that's important in terms of doing, in doing uh, you know, uh, neurology and, or being a medical doctor as anything else. Right. I'd like to agree. Um, um, Dick, I don't know if you even remember me. I'm Stuart Diamond from class of 71. I was a, I was a double major in music and philosophy. Yes, the sound of your voice sounds familiar. Okay, well, yeah. thanks for that much. And I just want to, to read, um, just to say how influential that freshman year was and on my whole career. And I go, my career is often spent talking to people about how philosophy affected every step in my career, every achievement is clearly related to it and I can articulate it. And I'd love to email you and go through all these different things I have done and how those classes at Haverford influenced. And I can be very concrete and specific about it. And I'll, I'd love to do that. But I just want to compliment you what you 
what it meant in every step and every accomplishment is clearly goes back to those The other thing is, you see, it's something that we did then that I believe. Um, when you go back to the uh, basic course uh, in philosophy, you know, we didn't deal with uh, bioethics or applications. We dealt with this is something mm -hmm. I believe in. We dealt with the classic. We dealt with Plato, with Aristotle, with Hume, who, and so forth. I mean, it, I am still committed to this day that, and it's the way I like to teach philosophy, the encounter with the classics and a dialogue with them is the real way of uh, learning and teaching philosophy. And I still do that. Yeah. The written word is dead. The written the word is dead. Right? What? Is dead. Wasn't I, that the Phaedrus? No, I, 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 uh, I don't have philosophical discourse on that, but I could because I think that there are certain forms of the written dead word that encourage the spoken. Mm -hmm. The word engraved in one's soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a second at bat, uh, Dick. And, uh, you can take a third. Yeah, you know, okay, <laughs> I do. I've got a third, but first, mm -hmm. the second. Um, take us back to a rent a little bit. Um, yeah, sure. Um, to the book. Yeah. Um, you know, she speaks very admiringly on these periods of what she called revolutionary spirit. Yes. And, um, you know, the examples are certain times during the American and French revolutions, the Paris Commune, the right. Russian Soviets, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, what characterized those periods? It's, it's what she called, or what you called, I, I, I can't remember whether it's you or she, good politics. It is, quote, a form of no rule. Yes. Politics does not involve one individual or group ruling over another. Yeah. Rather, political equality is essential for politics. We debate and act among our peers. Yeah. So to bring this up to date, I, you know, I'm trying to, you know, what are the lessons here? Where, where do we go? If, if Arendt had been alive this century, I think she would have seen what happened in 2011 in Tahrir Square or uh, Syntagma Square in Athens or the Occupy Wall Street movement. She would have been very sympathetic. Yes. Because that's exactly what they tried to do in their own small ways until they were crushed. Yeah. Now, the, the interesting thing is that these more recent events, they very often self-identified as anarchists. Yeah. Now, you know, anarchism is a dirty word, but where, you know, why can't we see, you know, and I guess Hannah Rent didn't want to call herself an anarchist because it had certain historical connotations, but yeah. isn't that actually what she's talking about? I would, I mean, that, that, that's a little too quick, but I would say this, if we now take anarchism not in its popular image of people throwing bombs or, you know, th things like that, but believing that um, spontaneously people can get together and rule themselves, then there is a very significant overlap between that. I mean, and, and indeed, um, I mean, there are two, the, I'll tell you the really the, the, the really difficult problem that I think nobody has solved. Um, she resonated to those moments, which she called the revolutionary spirit, where suddenly people get together, they can, they, what she calls empowerment can grow. And we've seen some significant movements like that. I mean, I think she, she, didn't, she died before solidarity, but there is a movement that you know, began with people talking around the kitchen you know, about ideas that did grow, that did speak, and it and, and, and important change the world, at least it overthrew communism, uh, Solomonism uh, in this. I think that the hard problem that she struggled with, and I don't think she ever uh, uh, solved, um, and it remains with how you keep that spirit alive. How do you keep, you know, um, the spirit of, debating and talking with 
peers and so forth. I mean, uh, at the end of the revolution, she talks about Jefferson and his idea about the wards and so forth. Um, but I think that this is, um, I mean, I don't want to bring in both Max May, but it's a very deep problem. Um, let me now relate it very personal. You know, um, I do think that one of the exciting moments in my life is participating in the civil rights movement, particularly at this point when it was really nonviolent, and particularly at the point in which white and blacks could work together, you know, which is what did happen in 1954. And, you know, many people think uh, like, well, about the danger, and it's true that I was uh, in Mississippi just a few weeks after um, uh, the three, uh, three change, workers yeah. were murdered and before their bodies were, were uh, discovered. But a wren caught something, which has always stayed, stayed. It was, we didn't think of danger. You thought of the excitement, the joy. That we're getting off our, you know, after all this done with college students and young professors, getting off your ass and doing something, and doing something that was meaningful oh, for people. Um, I do not know the answer. I know it. I know what the phenomenon is, and I know it frequently is short lived. But how you can perpetuate it is a problem that I think is a deep problem that I don't know the answer. Let me let me raise a possibility, and I, I don't think I, you know, obviously I don't have the answer either. Yeah, but. It seems to me everything is so politicized this, these days. Everything has to be seen in a political frame and all solutions have to be seen as political solutions. And I think what we're beginning to see now in the rebirth of the labor movement yeah. is a forum which recreates a lot of the elements that Arendt's talking about. Um, you have, they, 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 they can be venues, they can be venues for real democratic discourse. The issues that unions confront are basic to people's lives, just the same as political issues. In fact, they overlap. There's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of overlap. The issue of race often disappears yeah. in the best cases. So I, I'm beginning to believe that we need to focus more on what's going on in people's working lives and encourage that that, that is the venue in which we might see these sorts of things emerge and, and work. I mean, I, I, Ben, I'm sympathetic with you. I'm not, uh, I think, I, I, I don't know if I just want to label the labels, but I would put it different. I would say, that, uh, look, nobody better than our rent understood the horrors of what we normally call politics and top-down politics, how it ends up in totalitarianism. But the other vision which he's offering in, is not something that has to go on, you know, or, or like the, um, uh, uh, this is a statement from Dewey, but it's very Arendtian. Politics is what goes on in Washington or Albany. It, it frequently it goes on when people get together and uh, and and really do communicate and discourse. And that phenomenon can take place in the workplace. It could take place, you know, with your colleagues at a university and so forth. Those are the moments to be cherished, nurtured, and developed. In which you're speaking with peers, you're arguing with them, and you're true. And the, uh, there is a kind of, um, um, you know, again, I, I don't want to get into, I mean, the, sometimes I think the most interesting we, way of reading art on these issues is not as a blueprint, not something that's going to work on a kind of grand scale, but rather a phenomenon that don't go away, that can be replicated in many different kinds of, and in, in places where people don't think of that, uh, that that's politics, in community organizations, um, et, et cetera. So I think what she, her positive vision of politics uh, is something that takes place in many, many areas or can take place in many areas of life that we don't normally think of as political. Right. right. And I share that, yeah. 
Uh, William Purvis, I'm sorry I missed your hand being up because you're way up in my corner, the corner of my screen, but please take the floor and unmute, yes. Thank you. That's generally the hand oh, of the person is usually up in the left-hand corner, so I've, I've been hiding there. Thank yeah. you. Um, Professor Bernstein, I have to say it's so inspiring to hear you once again, and also it's so inspiring to be back in this uh, incredible community again. I've been so apart from this in all these years. And uh, what I would say, uh, and this is all corollary to what was said before by Tom and others, but what is the same, Professor Bernstein, about you now is has nothing to do with the content, but has to do with um, the, uh, actually, <laughs> I have a distinct memory of a uh, class, it was phenomenology course, I believe, in which somehow you came around to the topic of, you were musing about what do the great philosophers have in common? And you um, um, distilled this to the ruthless drive to comprehend. Yeah. And I would say that's the part that right now that comes through so strongly that is really infectious. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, but um, just to start with a confession, I haven't read your book on Hannah Arendt. Okay. That's my to-do list now, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I have to say I haven't been reading a lot of philosophy in the years since Haverford. It's affected me a lot, that my time there affected me a lot, but I haven't been reading philosophy. And I am remembering from a Hegel course that in the introduction at one point he says that it's also a process. You can't just study and then you understand it. It's the process of understanding it is as important as the, the material that you're understanding. So I, uh, that's my other confession. And so I will <laughs> get back to working on that, which connects with what was being said before about the, you know, how important it is to keep working on these things individually in yourself and reflecting. But the other part, so I'll, that's on my to-do list. I'll do better. Mm -hmm. But the other part of this that I'm more um, concerned about is there were several several times today that the issue of how to accomplish this in a community was raised. And in fact, recently you were saying about discourse, uh, how important discourse is. But I would guess that among all of us on these um, Hollywood squares that um, for the most part, uh, discourse in the workplace or in the universities is still, you know, pretty much within a bubble. And you had said early on about how do we escape from these bubbles? I think that's a really important question because somehow out of what has happened over these 50 years, um, these bubbles are very strongly geographic as well as um, political. Yeah. I'm thinking of the area that I come from in Western Pennsylvania, which is pure Trump country now. It's yeah. you know, the normal small town deteriorated uh, America. Um, and the other, thing that I think connects to this um, is uh, in terms of discourse has to do with um, the, the point that was raised about uh, the Warren, I believe, raised about the, uh, the ways in which the left can inhibit free discourse. But the, the, and we all recognize that, but the, the danger in recognizing that is one of false equivalency. And we watch this all the time in the, um, in the news when they bring up a person on one side who's trying to right. argue and on the other side basically is spewing lies and either the of the kind self-delusional kind or of the kind that uh, are propaganda of some type and i'm i'm thinking back to um uh anti-semite and jew and that um how does someone who's freely trying trying to engage in free discourse and um freely thinking, engage with someone who is basically coming from a um, not uh, uh, a, a not, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not rational viewpoint. Maybe I've said enough for now, I'll let it go there. No, no, no. But those are points that I'm, I'm really in my bubble here and I'm in Connecticut, I'm at Yale, I'm, I'm in a bubble. I'm, how, how, how do we escape from those, all of those bubbles? Yeah. You know, uh, first of all, before we even talk, am I looking at a real background? Is that your house? Yes. It's beautiful. You Thank know? you. Yes. 
If I were Paul Desjardins, dead, I would start noticing your pillars and your and your <laughs> bricks. You know? Where is the house? Is it in Western Pennsylvania? No, this is in Connecticut. Oh, um, Connecticut. It's, I see. It's, it's, not, uh, it's near Old Saybrook, Connecticut. This is Deep River, Connecticut. I see. And is it a reconverted uh, barn or is it a... Uh, huh? I'm, I'm sorry, but now we'll venture into architecture. This is a house that was built and in... 19- well, that's fine 19- with me, but I'll get back to your issues. Yeah. Okay, 1978 by a builder for himself. Uh-huh. And the beams that you see basically come from a barn in Vermont somewhere. They're not structural, but they're very beautiful. This is, we very much love this house. And it's all, all around us is woods, basically. I see. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to get to you, but I, uh, it's, it's not irrelevant. Um, you know, we, uh, Paul, you know, did you ever go up to Paul's house in the Adirondacks? I was there several times, actually. Okay, well, as a result of Paul, we built a house in the Adirondacks. And Paul found the beams, and he found the stones. Um, and to this, this is, we built the house in, it's a lovely Desjardins story, and I don't want to go into great detail, but we built it in 72, 73. And it is, I've written many of my books up there and things. So I'm sensitive uh, to this. I, I think I am a frustrated architect you know, <laughs> myself. Um, but, you know, um, look, it's difficult to draw a line. I do not want to be interpreted as saying, that things are going to get better. I believe that what we're living in is extraordinarily fragile and things can get much worse. You know, that's what I think. So I'm not optimistic in that in that sense, but I am committed to not giving up and to trying and to whatever encounter it is. I don't know, you know, about your neighbors, your community, your school board. One can reach out. I mean, what I try to do you know, I've now taught thousands of students is to somehow inspire with that kind of vision wherever they go you know, to do it because that's, and, and, and what we know that there are moments where this happens. You know, I go back to some of my, you know, early days, a graduate student at Yale. It was during the McCarthy, it was during our Eisenhower years, people, thought that nothing is going to change. And what I began to witness is the growth of the student movement, you know, uh, fighting McCarthyism, becoming, fighting the House on American, everything. And suddenly, then, for example, the, the growth of the civil rights movement. So I think, this is a Arendtian, I think Arendt says, you know, when her kind of political action, she likens it to a kind of miracle. In a miracle in the sense you don't know when something is going to something going to grow and develop. You, know, you just don't know. And it's important to keep working because we know enough about history that we've seen how this has happened at various moments. And there's nothing that I think that rules it out in terms of the present or the future. You know, most of what we do is going to end up in terms of political and so the effect. Okay. You know, there's an old Jewish joke, I think Ari may have told it to me, uh, that might be appropriate here. Um, God looks down at the world and he decides, of course, like many Jewish jokes, they're always telling the story about how the Jews come out on top. But God looks down at the world and he finds that it's so awful that this time he um, decides that there's going to be 40 fathoms of water, 40 days of rain, and no survivors. And he sends his archangel, uh, Michael, down to tell the various heads of religious organizations that this is what's going to happen. He goes to the Pope, and the Pope you know, gets down on his knees and plays that there is going to be some place in the afterlife of the devoted flock. He goes to the head of the Protestant churches and he tries to negotiate and make a deal with him. Finally, it's always, in the, when it's a Jewish story, it's always a kind of Jewish rabbi from Vilna. He goes to the Vilna and he says, you know, 40 days of rage, 40 fathoms, no survivor. And the little Jewish rabbi looks him straight in the eye and he said, you know, 
it's going to be tough living under 40 fathoms of water. You know? <laughs> the moral of the story is, you know, okay, so things are awful. It's going to be tough. You don't give up. <laughs> uh, Al? Yeah. You want to jump in, Al Woodward? Yeah, I, um, I have a question that's probably coming out of left field. And um, that's a good place to be. <laughs> well, you know, you know what I mean, both politically as well as baseball. So uh, one of the things I think everybody's aware of is the increasing um, disparity in income and wealth yes. that's going on in this country. And so as I was thinking about that, when the topic of marginalization was raised, no. Uh, meaning that there are people, the voters, I mean, I'm thinking of Trump, vote, Trump voters, and I must say no. that I do know half a dozen at least, and I do talk with them in person on the phone. Good. And uh, we don't get anywhere, but at least I try to listen. I don't, mm -hmm. they know what I, they know where I'm coming from. So yeah. my question is, how, how does that connect? Because my initial thinking is that, um, uh, the way the, um, uh, the, the economic autocracy works in this country, it works against kind of the democratic impulses that will help those marginalized. And those who are marginalized, from what I recall of what my friends have told me, they, you know, they just don't, they're just not really comfortable with a lot of what democracy is really all about. Yeah, that's it. Well, no, I mean, look, you're raising a really deep issue and a hard one. Um, uh, I mean, and I think it's ultimately about whatever our system wants to call it, financial capital, speculative, financial capitalism, um, that this tendency towards inequality is not going to really change unless we can figure out some way <laughs> to make our system, if we don't have to be anarchist or communist or whatever, unless we can make it you know, more responsive uh, to the people. I mean, um, I don't want to say, say you know, I, I don't think this is, I mean, I, I, what I admire about the president, president, I think he's aware of the issue and he thinks he can do something about it. I'm not sure it, what can be done unless you really change some deep things about how the system works. Because in the end, we're living in a city, a system where money wins out in the end, where money runs things. And that I think there could be gestures, but the tendency towards the enormous disparity between the extremely wealthy and those who are not, um, uh, I don't have any kind of clear solution to how that's going to happen. You know, um, I certainly favor those political gestures to try to ameliorate it in some ways. But if you go into the history of what's happened with the economic, whatever you want to call it, it's hard to be optimistic about the time. But, you know, OK, so it's tough. Up, but you, you have to keep knocking your head against it and keep trying in different sorts of ways to bring about a little bit more kind of equity than at now it's here. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that the problem is there and I know how deep it is and I know what it requires, how what it, can, what it requires could ever happen is something that I just don't know. Yeah. By the way, what are all those good books behind you? You have a lot of books, good books there, all right? Can you hear me? Who Who is that? Who are you referring to? He's talking to Al. Al Al's yeah. muted, though. Yeah. Oh, I see. Al, you have to unmute. I can't find him. Right there. there we are. So they're largely from my parents. But they have, OK. Oh, yeah, I wanted to know what all the good books are in the background. There, they're not there's some philosophy in there, but it's mostly novels and whatnot that I got from my parents, and I've added to. I see. Okay. Fiction. Okay. My remember my wife was always, uh, you know, my wife taught at Bryn Mawr, and her field is literature. So you now, 
reading novels is not a bad thing. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you know, I'm thinking that uh, maybe this is the time to wind down. Okay. Um, geez, it's been a real pleasure, um, Dick, to have you, yeah. have you back in the fold. Um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what else to say. I think it's been a tremendous hour and a half. Um, I really yeah. enjoyed it. And uh, we thank you for, um, you know, giving us this time. And uh, we look forward to hearing of you uh, more and more as the years go by. Thank you. Now, I'm glad to hear that many people think I sound just the same. Oh, you do. I, do yeah. think, I like to think things so. I don't think I've ever, you know, uh, my convictions have not changed. They have deepened. Mm. And I take very seriously the idea, whether you're living in dark times or hard times, or you see them in the thing, that you have to keep wor working. I mean, it's not Sisyphus. It makes a difference. And there are causes, you know, even let me just take, take one thing, which is, you know, sometimes you hear the idea, oh, things are just going down, they're getting worse and worse. I don't like to think of those hopeful levels. Think in more modest levels. Think in terms of what's happened with uh, LGBT, with gays and le lesbians. I never would have believed 30 years ago we would ever come to to a where it's legal to have same sex mar marriage. That is, I, I, I know people who terribly suffer because um, of their homosexuality of being a lesbian. It's a wonderful thing. I see it now with my grandchildren. They grow up in a world, of course, it's in LA and it, 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 where they're, they have friends who are gay, they have friends who are same sex thing and so forth. It's for them, it's all. Normal. That's progress with a small p. That's the way progress frequently comes, with a small p, not with a capital p. And we should not ignore that. Okay. Anyway, it's lovely to be with you. And as I told you, you you will all go to sleep and I'll still be talking. <laughs> we, we had one person. I have one more. Let's wind up with one more person. He he, he piped up and, and let's Chris Colvin has a question to ask. We'll oh, make Chris. Where's Chris? Mm, yeah. Somewhere. I got to unmute. Well, this has brought back a lot of uh, uh, grand old memories. Uh, I've always been a pariah. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I gave an anti Vietnam War speech at graduation. And I got the award for the John F. Kennedy Award for the protection of uh, minority opinion. Good. And when I got to Haverford, I became, I was considered to be a right winger and a uh, conservative and a, uh, I want to bring back the memory though of 1970. You remember when finals were canceled and we all went uh, to protest in Washington, DC? I remember it vividly because it was the day my son was born. <laughs> and, yeah. and the, and the, uh, 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 the draft lottery. Do you remember the big riot in the parking lot uh, where they where the guys destroyed their cars when everybody got their yeah. draft numbers? You remember that? Yeah. So I got my draft number fifty, and I went to the uh, my pre induction physical down in uh, Philadelphia, and I managed to talk them out of uh, drafting me. Uh, by uh, objecting to the constitutionality of two of their questions. Uh -huh. One of them was about homosexuality and the other one was about drug addiction. And I told them I thought both those things were illegal and that uh, we lived in America and we weren't obligated to testify against ourselves. And the guy said, uh, uh, this is the army, answer the question. And I raised my hand again and said, is uh, marijuana addictive? And it brought down the house and he didn't like it. And they flunked me for a varicose vein I never knew I had and still looks about the same today. And once I got free of the uh, selected service, I decided that I was fed up with society and I moved to the mountaintops of Montana. And I lived as a survivalist for three years. 
And when I came back down, I found myself in a being a, a liberal radical again in a <laughs> deeply red state. And uh, so anyway, that uh, uh, I'm in the process of trying to write a book that it's tentatively titled uh, Conspiracy Theory, which is about uh, current politics and about the trajectory going forward. The question I was gonna ask you is, I was gonna ask you what you thought Trump's ultimate historic impact would be. And I was gonna offer my thought that he's actually a provocateur and that his function will be to make us all think. Think how much we've all learned about the constitution in recent yeah. years. And think about how much we've learned about viruses and the genome yeah. and the nuts and bolts of government. And, but anyway, I was just uh, uh, thought I would throw that in your direction. Uh, you might have something yeah. to say about that. Yeah, one thing is I, I'm always wary about predicting the future about this. I do think that Trump and the whole regime and the attitude that he was fostering would did tremendous um, damage on the very con con of American democracy. And I think it's still a battle that we have to worry about. I mean, I think that some, some forms of authoritarianism can really win in the country. That's a real possibility. And if people just believe that democracy is just, you know, you know, one thing I do not believe is, well, you know, these are threats to democracy, but it won't annihilate it. No, I think it could be annihilated. I think that, you know, when the people used to, was a famous book, it can't happen here, it can happen. Here. And that's why I feel that you have to try and fight these things in, in the future. So I don't know what's going to happen. I could envision an election in four years where you know Trump comes roaring back, and then I think it will be. A, a, and, and anybody would say that it's not really possible. It's not going to happen. It could happen, and if not, then this is something replaced. So I, it's because you know I'd say you know ending what we take what I cherish about democracy is a real possibility is why I'm so adamant about, you know, trying to be active, trying to keep up the good fight and trying to encourage my students to do the, do the same. So, uh, you know, it's not based on the idea, oh yeah, it's really all gonna get better. People come to the sanity, I really don't know, but I'm sure democracy is not gonna, you know, Dewey said it, and I believe it. If we don't keep working at it, it it's it's just going to become hollow and insignificant. So that would be my final message on this uh, uh, thing. So keep up the good work. Okay? We'll try. We'll try. Yeah. Thanks a bunch, Dick. Yeah. Okay. Good. Lovely talking to you. Okay. Thank you, Dick. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your Thanks, indulgence Dick. for two hours listening to me. <laughs> okay. It's been great. For a long time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank Ben, you. for putting this together. It was Thank great. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Anybody night. wants Appreciate to email? It. Anybody wants well, to email yeah. about anything? Don't hesitate. And Susan, don't forget to write to me because I want to. Give I you I will write to you. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. Good. But I'm happy to be in contact with anybody who's got questions or or further reflections on what, some of the things that we've said, okay? I'm I glad can, to hear that I'm not so different than I was. <laughs> Get your email address to people through Chris. I, I have to tell this last anecdote. I remember when I was young and said, oh yeah, that's the way you talk now, but when you, you get older, you're going to become conservative and moderate like the rest of us. And I'm glad I've lived long enough to prove that I had coffee. Do well and thrive. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to when we can all get bye, together in person and uh, knock some uh, beers down and.
be able yeah. to slap each other in the back. So, but anybody, anybody never... of the group who is in New York City, let me know. I'll take you out for lunch. Okay. <laughs> and anybody who would like to feel better about where they live is welcome to come stay with me in Alabama a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I suggest that uh, when the class of 70 meets on campus in May of uh, 22, that we uh, that we invite Professor Bernstein to come and celebrate with us. Yep. Oh, I, I'd be happy to celebrate. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Every day is a gift for me. I just hope I live long enough. Okay. Be well <laughs> and thrive. This is a gift to us. Okay. Okay. Bye now. All right. Bye. 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 Thanks, my guys. Mm. Be well, everyone.